during these few minutes of silence. You can focus on something you're grateful for, someone you're remembering especially today, or just the pace of your own breath. We find a comfortable place in your seat. Take a few easy breaths as we settle into the shared silence together. Amen. Will you join me in prayer? Spirit of life, gracious God, source of all, we see you in the parched earth and in the sodden garden. We feel you in the rain and in the cool after the rain. We know you in our rest and even in our unwanted wakefulness. Present in our peace and present in our distress. We know you in the hands of our neighbors and the rebuilding after destruction and the strength of the human spirit. We pray especially today for those teachers, children, parents, grandparents, school staff, child care workers, janitors, school administrators. May they be safe. May their decisions be wise. May they know and feel their lives more precious than the economy, more precious than education, more precious even than the feeling of normalcy, which we all so badly crave for which we all so powerfully hunger. We pray also for anybody on the front lines, anybody in healthcare, anybody in grocery stores, restaurants. 
for anyone who lives alone, for anyone in mourning, in missing the embrace of friends and family, for all of us whose loved ones are far away and ailing, for the increase of sorrow, at the same time as the decrease of present and tangible help. We pray also for joy, for the lifting of the burden of guilt, for the easing of the anxiety, the constant questioning and doubting of decisions, the soothing of the fear of the harm that might come to us or the harm that we might bring to others. We pray for strength, for conviction, for tenderness for ourselves and with one another, for moral clarity. For good company in our feelings of helplessness and rage. We ask these things for ourselves and for those we love and for those we do not love. Amen. Our reading this morning comes to us from the poet Jesse Reynolds. If my body is a temple, it is a temple devoted to me. My calloused feet were crafted to walk the road my heart calls for. My dry skinned hands were created to carry out the work my soul demands. If my body is a temple, it was built already abandoned. I came to it as a deer in the clearing, tentative, hopeful, and began the slow work of tending to the brambles and broken stones. I knelt in the rock-studded dirt and pruned the overgrown bushes so the flowers had space and light to grow. I pulled out weeds by their roots, only to find they were flowers too. I wept for their death, sometimes in the night is heaviest, I still do. If my body is a temple, I am a poor steward. I have not repaired the fallen roof. I have not reinforced the sunken dais where my altar stands. I have a tendency to sleep through morning prayers. I am a poor steward, but I am the only steward this body has ever known. 
I am the one who sweeps the crinkled leaves from the threshold in autumn. I am the one who lights incense as moonlight tiptoes through the hole in the roof. I am the one who rings the low tumbling bell to call myself to worship. If my body is a temple, I am its only congregant. But I am not alone. When I look out over the hills, I see flames stretching into every shadow, flickering into every temple window. And every night as the darkness falls, I light one extra candle. Its light reaches out, unstained by the broken glass, and I say a silent prayer that I too might be seen. Would you like know how would you like to know how to get a beach body? Go to the beach. Congratulations. How easy it is to make light of the advertisements and the tabloids and the messaging that constantly bombards us, um, everyone, but especially uh, women, non-binary people, femme-looking people. Definitely the body you have isn't good enough. And so here are some ways to improve it that you can pay for. How easy it is also to simply instruct, resist all of that. Just love yourself, you know, just do it. Easy as pie. We are bombarded and surrounded by messaging that demeans our relationships with our bodies also by systems and structures that purport to control them, to tell us which kinds of bodies are good ones to have and which kinds of bodies are a problem, which ones are expensive for the insurance companies, which ones you can really only afford to fully inhabit if you can pay for the affirming surgeries or the hormone therapy or whatever it is that you need or want to help create the temple of your body in the way that allows you to live the most fully. How easy it is both to shame and also to just instruct that we don't feel shame. So I'm going to do neither of those things This morning, I'm not going to congratulate you on your weight loss. I'm also not going to shame you for it. Not going to participate in discussing which foods are good and which ones are bad. Nor am I going to wag my finger at you if your relationship with those things is complicated. We are, in fact, subject to the culture in which we live. Our psyches and our memories and our priorities are shaped and affected by the systems in which we all participate. And I do not believe that the solution is found individual by individual. But instead, I'll say this, we are Unitarian Universalists. We affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person, of every body. For centuries and centuries, the body has been considered a problem, a major league theological problem, the site of sin. We're going to try to learn and teach one another 
to inhabit our bodies in a different way. The body is not a problem. Your body is not a problem. It's not an inconvenience or an unfortunate house for the mind. The bodies are good, even yours. The book of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible in chapter one, verse 31, tells us that after six days of hard work, creating the whole cosmos and the earth and all the living creatures, that God saw everything God had made. And indeed, it was very good. Those ancient work words speak through the ages to me like a spell. God called it all good. There are a lot of reasons why it can be difficult for us to know and to call our own bodies good. So for me, it helps to know that it's written down in a really old book, read by a lot of people, passed on generation to generation, that the source of life itself has called us all good. And yet we do not live in the Garden of Eden, and we do not live in a world where everyone has enough to eat. We do not live in a world that honors the sacred temple of every body. However overgrown, however broken down. However hath fallen the roof, However sunken the dais, however late we sleep through morning prayers in the temples of our bodies. Instead, we live in a world and in a country built on the violation of bodies, the commodification of bodies, the control of bodies. Young children talk about how they want to lose weight or they don't like their hair or they don't want to be in the sun too long because they might get, quote, too dark. Our babies internalize messages from all around us that their body is something others can control and that their body is somehow not a blessing. And no wonder they get these ideas young, yeah. some part of it is ours, some part of it is adults, the way that we talk about our own bodies, the concerns we express out loud about the ways that we are not good enough, that our flesh is not deserving of love and reverence just the way it is. And so the tiny people in our care pick up our shame. But also, they get these ideas from the very real fact that it's legal to control who can access reproductive care, legal to debate whether or not trans people deserve to be safe and appropriately medically tended to legal enough, legal to make necessary surgery and affirming care cosmetic, um, read extremely expensive, often not covered by insurance, Legal to police and surveil and harass low-income, mostly brown and black neighborhoods. And by neighborhoods, of course, we mean places where people live, and by people, we mean bodies. It is made ever more plain to us that we do not live in a society that values bodies at all, especially not the bodies of those who are already marginalized, people with disabilities, people of color. We have sacrificed and we continue to sacrifice people's lives, people's bodies, because the class of corporate backed politicians has refused to send enough money to keep people home. It 
it is too easy to lay all of the blame for the failure at the federal level to respond adequately to this crisis at the feet of the president. Politicians from all parties repeat the phrase, the economy, like a charm. Like the magic words you need to say in order to justify the sacrifice of bodies. Some of this failure we can chalk up to pro profound greed at the very top. But the rest of us have not so far exercised our collective muscle to make a change, to force their hand. And I suggest that at least part of that problem is this profound American allergy to care for the sake of care. We have not as a society, fully taken it into our minds and hearts and hands and bodies that everyone deserves to live well, that there is enough, that a better world is possible. We seem to believe instead that people should earn it, that people should somehow have had savings. We say people shouldn't get something for nothing. Many people have made more money on unemployment than at their jobs. To be clear, the problem with that is the wages those jobs pay in the first place. We seem to be obsessively devoted to describing the circumstances under which people deserve to be taken care of. This does seem to be the dominant cultural tone. When we say our affirmation at the beginning of our worship service, we end it with, thus do we covenant with each other and with God. Part of our covenant with one another is to affirm and promote the worth and dignity of every person. There is some small rescue in this covenant with one another. There is something afoot these days when all of us are simultaneously a threat to all of us, but also we know that we will care for each other and see each other through, most especially against the backdrop of colossal failure of leadership. There is something stirring in our collective psyche. We are more aware of our own bodies. We are more considerate of other people's bodies. We are more attentive to how close or how far apart we are. We have collectively gotten better at consent. Would you like me to sit six feet away? Would you prefer more? Let's go for a walk, but make sure we wear our masks. I will stay in my house and limit my contact with anyone for two weeks so that I can come to see you for a weekend. Yes, I will get a COVID test. Yes, I Google every possible twinge or cough or ache to see if it could possibly be a symptom of coronavirus. And then I text everyone I was near in the last week. Yes, I will be more thoughtful with you, more tender, more gentle. Complete strangers are entering two weeks of isolation to prepare to go on first dates. At the same time, we are struggling. Gyms are closed. Many of us lack energy. It seems like everyone I know on medication for depression or anxiety is upping their dosage. There's a real lack of things to look forward to and we feel that in our bodies also. Our habits have been dramatically changed. We are imperfect stewards, poor stewards, says the poet. I think because we were not made to tend to all that we are holding while we feel so alone. We do everything we can to keep each other safe. And we try to forget how miserable it makes us. Our covenant with one another costs us. 
sometimes. Our covenant with God, with the source of all life, if that's a translation of that concept that works better for you, is a promise made to us. Covenant with one another is the promise we make to one another, but built on the foundation of the promise made to us. The promise that it is good to live, that the great unearned gift of being alive is worth inhabiting more fully, unwrapping more carefully and more reverently and passing on the creative power at the heart of life, the spark that animates the cosmos from the bumblebee to the aurora borealis also beats in you in your heart, in your body, exactly how it is. And so imperfect stewards though we are of the temples we did not create, a blessing for us all. The way that you live most fully into the temple of your body is good. In the face of devastation and destruction, in the face of constant calculation and recalculation of risk, the way that you tend the stones and the flowers, the way that you come to cherish the weeds, to learn that they are flowers too, the way that you shape yourself or choose to accept with love and ease the shape you have been given is good. Even when you struggle, even when you ache, even when you look in the mirror and wince, even when you long for abilities that have fled you, even when you endure and recall the worst things, even when you are dying, even when you are doing the best you can in this veritable minefield of racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, fat phobia, classism, all other forms of state sanctioned cruelty visited upon us that we visit upon one another, even then. Even then the spirit of life, the spark of the divine inhabits you through your breath, through your body. So however you relate to the messages we receive about which bodies are good, which deserve to be protected, however exposed you are to this virus, however fearful you are, however you feel about yourself these days, however you feel about the way you look, whatever level of pain you're in, some fortification for the temple of your body is this something much older than you, the beating heart of life, the great unearned gift, has observed the world and called it good already. And that includes you, imperfect steward of your only temple. May you know it, may you pass it on, May it be so for you and so for us all. Amen. Okay. Come sing a song with me. sing a song with me come sing a song with me come sing a song with me that i might know your mind and i'll bring you hope when hope is hard to find and i'll sing a song of love and a rose in the winter time Come dream a dream with me, come dream a dream with me, come dream a dream with me that I might know your mind. And I'll bring you hope when hope is hard to find, and I'll bring a song of love and a rose in the winter time. Come walk in rain with me come walk in rain with me come walk in rain with me that i might know your mind and i'll bring you home when hope is hard to find and i'll bring a song of love and a rose
snows in the winter time. Come share a rose with me. Come share a rose with me. Come share a rose with me that I might know your mind. And I'll bring you hope when hope is hard to find. And I'll bring a song of love and a rose in the winter time.